Okay, so without further ado, I'll hand things over to Robert and Graham to get us underway. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Fionn. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, a pleasure to be here, and um, thanks for taking the time. Uh, hard for me to see if I've met any, if there's any familiar faces. We were at the uh, symposium a couple weeks ago um, in out near the airport in Toronto. It was nice to uh, to get to know and, and meet uh, many members across the province. And um, if we uh, if we had a chance to meet, then it's a pleasure to see you again. Today's presentation is um, a little bit, little insight into, you know, we're, we're an HR human resources company that supports um, our partners across the province and a little insight into our world and some of the tips and tricks that, um, that we use to bring in the best talent and um, retain them. And perhaps you can use that on your end as well if, um, you know, if necessary. So I'm gonna share my screen. Um, we have some slides to complement the presentation, but certainly look forward to, um, to everyone's questions. If you have any, I'm happy to keep the conversation informal and, um, and hopefully you'll, you'll take away a couple of tidbits. Um, as I start to share my screen here, um, Eon, can you confirm, can you see my screen on my end, the slides? Um, nope. Nope. Okay. Let's just make okay. sure. Let's just yeah. I'm going to do this again. Okay. Make sure I got this going properly. Yeah. Also, I take the opportunity to introduce um, Graham Bashford, who's one of the directors at our team at Staff Relief, who's a a uh, seasoned healthcare professional, has a lot of experience and stories to share as well. And um, I'm really glad he's going to be joining us today. Looks good, Robert. You onto that work now? You can see everything looks, okay? Yep, looks great, thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so let's get started. Um, we've got a, an interesting agenda for you today. So just to kick it off, um, a quick overview about who we are if we're a new partner organization to, to some of you on, um, on the Zoom today. Uh, so that might be helpful to set the stage. But then we're gonna get into a couple, we call tips and tricks, some of our best practices in staffing. Um, Certainly following the candidate life cycle. So everything from screening initially to verifying, and training and onboarding, and then ultimately plugging the hole in the bottom of the barrel and keeping the staff that you spend a great deal of time trying to uh, to orientate properly. Um, and then of course, lots of questions at the end, I hope. So a little bit about staff relief. We are a, a Canadian family run business, as we like to say for to, to people across the province who meet us, they'll often use that word, oh, are you guys an agency? Um, and yes, we we do, you know, we do fall under that bucket, but we try everything to, to be to not be the typical staffing agency. That's really not how we identify. We're a partner to those in the community. Um, with a multitude of needs. We do lots of work in the developmental support sector, hospital sector, nursing home, long-term care, community work, um, and working lots with directly with families who need um, care, either directing passport funding or, or have some private funds that they need to spend as well. And that's certainly a passion of ours. Um, a, a fairly large team across Ontario, about six, 700 staff across the province with a great team internally, of course, supporting it. But we're an organization that really wears our heart on our sleeves. We, we, we have family members in the care of others ourselves. And we know what, it go, what goes into um, you know, training and, and receiving the best care. And, and everyone who joins our staff early family um, is, is quite heavily screened from that perspective that they're good enough that we'd send to our own family if we're gonna send them to others. You know, our values are um, always starting with compassion. You know, when you're caring for others, you, um, you know, you need a certain type of personality. Um, training is, is of course table stakes, but you have to, you're in it for the right reason. So we always start with that, you know, and then move obviously to the technical expertise, the excellence and knowing what you need to do. And then, you know, the respect and integrity of, of doing the right things, even when, you know, the cameras are, are, are not on and, and people don't see you. Um, knowing that uh, our team members would make the same decisions that we would um, gives us a lot of ease. 
We are proudly a caring company as well. So, you know, we do uh, give back to the community in many ways, financially and with our time. And um, it's very important that, um, you know, that we continue to build and support all the communities across Ontario um, that we're, uh, we're blessed to be part of. Um, I am happy to share that this is not a one-man show. So we've got many different departments in the organization, um, everything from, um, you know, clinical leadership with Oleg being our director of healthcare. We've got a client care coordination team, which comprised about 10 people who are assisting with uh, HR and making sure that our phones never stay off. We're on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, weekends, holidays. We've got an HR team, um, you know, making sure that we've got the best people, which, you know, that team was very instrumental in being together for the presentation today. And, um, you know, an under Graham team of people continuing to engage in the community and, and find out different ways that we can be helpful and supportive to, to those that need it. Um, I wasn't able to produce a map that was big enough that where these bubbles would actually uh, be meaningful, but we are... Um, in all major city centers across Ontario, as far west as Windsor, as far east as Ottawa. Um, we love, you know, working in, in towns where there's uh, lots of people, but also, um, you know, in places where, it, you know, there's, it's harder to get to. You know, we're helping some families right now and working to help them in Fenland Falls, if anyone's heard of that area, which is a little bit off the beaten track, but um, a wonderful area as well and and we're proud to go wherever the community needs us so we've got some creative solutions there if needed um so i'll pause there that's that's just a, a, a quick two minute overview about our organization our passion for the community and hopefully a following today if um if it's of interest to anybody to learn more uh, we can take some more time to delve into that and a little bit about who we are that special sauce what we wanted to share today uh, was some best practices on how we approach our core competency of bringing the best people to the community to support the group homes, the community centers, the families that, that lean on us day to day to help them with their you know, short-term staffing needs, their long-term staffing needs. So we wanted to go through um, you know, a little bit again about the candidate screening, um, some tips about uh, how we approach document verification training, you know, some practical onboarding tips and, and how we improve retention along with some, some stories from, uh, from the trenches. We've seen good and bad over the 25 years that we've been doing this and um, I'd love to share that with you. So when it comes to starting us off on that first topic of candidate screening, we, we try to approach our, our candidate screening you know, in a sort of six-step um, model. And many of these things you may have, you may already be implementing, and, and that would be great, or maybe you pick up one or two tidbits. Um, we have a lot of people that are applying to, to work at Staff Relief organically, and if we do post an ad, um, you know, through those platforms. And it can be challenging sometimes to weed out, you know, the you know hundreds of resumes you're getting who is really the cream of the crop who do we want to bring into our staff or we family who, we, who are we proud of you know it really starts with that accurate job description we find um the best candidates are reading that description and applying accordingly and and very easily you may find people that are not reading that description properly um you know we, we can weed them out right away that job description feeds into leveraging technology as well. So we use some applicant tracking systems. Um, if you're not familiar with an ATS, there are certain organizations like, you know, uh, Bamboo HR or, or Workable, which are, which are top quality products out there. Um, and it's, it's a, effectively a tracking software that can help streamline your resume screening process by scanning and sorting applications for you using preset data that you specify. Um, for example, if you're hiring a position and you require, you know, the candidate to have a certain degree or designation, you know, for example, a developmental support worker, you can have the program um, eliminate those who don't have that education level automatically. So, you know, we see more and more partners who are using this AI, artificial intelligence, along with their applicant tracking system to move resumes through the process and filter out people who are not qualified from those that are. 
Um, again, sort of dovetailing off that accurate job description, you need that. But using those those screening words are, if you do go this process, is very important because, you know, on the one hand, you want to find candidates that list all the skills and qualifications that you want. But on the other hand, um, not all qualified candidates may use the exact wording or verbiage you specify. So, you know, only really you know how strict or liberal you can be with your keyword sorting. Uh, but certainly keep in mind it's possible to miss qualified candidates if you're too restrictive. So perhaps ranking the importance of those screening keywords can help you choose the most important ones. And some of these softwares allow that. We find um, as well that posting the salary range for the job can be really important. Um, we've met many, many excellent candidates only to find out in the 11th hour they want twice the amount of the, the pay scale for a role. And you sometimes feel at that point, you've wasted your time. And um, at this point, we try to be really upfront with that fact and, and weed out people right away who have unrealistic expectations. So not to waste time. It's always uncomfortable to talk about salary and, and compensation as part of the role, but it's, um, it's an important piece as well. And, and something that we certainly, um, you know, encourage getting out of the way, uh, you know, sort of out of the gate. Um, incomplete applications there's in a way that we help whittle down the, the list pretty quickly. Certainly people that can't follow simple instructions up front or don't take time to read the job description, um, we translate that into perhaps future tendencies. Maybe they'd also be incomplete in their work or, or, or sloppy in, in, in other aspects. So that's another thing that you can use to, uh, to perhaps get to that small group right away. Um, we find that given that we're hiring in so many locations across the province and there's so many different demographics, um, it's challenging to take your personal bias as an HR organization out of the equation. We often use some blind hiring techniques to help avoid the, un the, the unconscious bias by focusing on skills and qualifications of the applicants, at least initially. Um, so we're not disqualifying candidates who could be a great fit, but maybe, um, you know, don't mit, fit the, the mold or background of, of previous individuals we've met. Um, sometimes we've used our ATS software to temp temporary block applicants' addresses, ethnicities, other personal information, so that our HR team can just focus on skills and abilities initially. Um, and it's, it's really helped us create a more diverse, inclusive workspace and, and make hiring decisions a little faster. So that's been a tip that's worked really well for us. Some common mistakes over the 20 plus years we've been doing this um, that, that perhaps you might be able to use and leverage to, to improve your process. Um, because of, of the structure of our organization, we're able to be very nimble. And we find making the application process too complicated um, you can lose candidates to others who are hiring for the exact same position. So at the same time, like, although you wanna challenge potential candidates and you wanna make them shine, if you make the initial process over complicated, your best talent might lose interest or um, get something, another opportunity instead. So, you know, sometimes the submission process, um, you know, having them do, we see another, Organizations require them to do a you know a cover letter or a video, personality test, skills-based test. Some of these things might make it too complicated that people just give up. Um, so we try to find a balance of getting making it easy for people to apply, but then screening them well. And that kind of goes into how to use your time strategically, because of course, rushing the recruiting process will hurt you just as severely as waiting for the perfect candidate. You know, if you hire too quickly, you could put a strain on your organization, you know, by perhaps, perhaps increasing the probability the candidate doesn't work out. And, and then you have to repeat the process over and over. But again, if you take too long, you know, you're jeopardizing perhaps your current team um, and they're stressed by overworking people who might have to be picking up extra shifts and, and so on and so forth. Um, so be mindful of sort of the correct amount of time to refine candidates um, and, and screen them properly, but 
um, you know, give, give some thought to that. And, and we try and, and balance that. And for the right candidate, we find the right person. We're, we're keen to sometimes just jump in immediately and, um, and maybe forgo other interviews because we know we've got the best fit right out of the gate. They happen to be the first person. Uh, references as well, we've seen over the many years um, can be very hit and miss. You know, people giving an honest reference is really hard to come by. And we find it's truthfully only the outlier scenarios in which people are really selling the truth. So for the average individual, a reference might just be something sort of melancholy. And we found um, success in not placing too much emphasis on record, on the references, having that sort of as a, uh, you know, a quick gut check, but, um, you know, not allowing that to really make or break a candidate and, and using our own um, decision making first. And the same comes with the interview as well. Um, we've, we've seen some amazing, excellent candidates who um, have done, you know, haven't had the best first interview. Sometimes people get nervous. Um, so we try and, um, and use competency based interviews to um, you know, or, or, or as well use a, um, you know, a test or exercise to find out how they might perform on the job. Um, you know, evaluating, we find evaluating skills and behaviors through diverse means um, allows a diverse range of candidates to shine. Um, and not every potential candidate can present themselves best under, you know, an interview or nerve wracking condition in that way. So um, thinking about that, giving that some thought as to how you screen candidates might, you um, um, you know, might, might change your perspective a little bit. Certainly worked well for us over, over the years. Graham, I thought you wanted to jump in here perhaps and share a story of some, uh, some interview trips. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, yeah, Robert laughed at me when I, when I threw this picture into the, uh, presentation. Um, it can be a matter of perspective, right? So there's one thing that being, being Ontario wide, our company, um, what what I've always adopted and have been able to do is is take that matter of perspective. It's hard to resumes don't define us, right? Uh, they they're representative of of our work experience. We all have one. They're not all necessarily true, right? Or might be embellished. Um, so I had this picture up here to say if you can get people in front of you, uh, it can be a matter of perspective. And so you could look at this picture and choose to see a lovely young woman kind of look glancing to the side with a choker necklace, or you could look at this picture and clearly see an older lady um, with a feather in her hair, uh, pursed lips, um, and kind of a closed eye, right? So keep that in mind when you're looking at resumes in that um, they don't define us. They're not, um, uh, you can go deeper than that. Um, and more specifically, um, uh, you guys at a community level can. Um, so what, how I was hired as a PSW, uh, in 2001 by an organization that had adopted group interviews. Um, and I've basically, I, I've, uh, I've used them ever since. So for 23 years, um, we, we, we don't have the opportunity to use a group interview. Um, it was at staff relief, um, just because we, we serve so many locations around Ontario, um, but I'd highly recommend it for organizations um, that you guys are in a set location. Um, first of all, it can be a real time saver. Um, so instead of you blocking off a day to interview eight potential candidates, you can you can block off one hour and quickly meet eight all at one time. Um, I wouldn't suggest really going more than eight or ten people. Otherwise, uh, it can it can be a, a little bit longer session. Um, but you can. Um, you know, the, these are kind of some of the things talking about perspective that uh, you watched and, and see how uh, candidates interact with each other. I mean, all of our resumes say we love people until you put us in a room full of people. Right. Um, so you can watch it, who's engaged, who's thoughtful, who listens to other people's answers. Um, and it can be very telling. Um it can just plain and simple increase awareness of the different services uh, that you offer in your community as well. So you have more people talking about what you do, how you do it, and it just really helps create that sense of community um, wherever it is that you work. Um, candidates can visit your location, um, note the distance from your house. 
uh, from, from where they live. Right. I mean, uh, of course this is coming from a guy that commutes from Kawartha Lakes to North York, but oftentimes like, um, they, you know, make your interview time at a time they might be on the road typically. Right. Um, so people, oh, you know, the commute wasn't that bad at 3 PM on a Wednesday afternoon, but if, if it was, uh, if it was 9 AM on a Monday morning, it might be a little bit different. So this can help you, your candidates judge the location and how hard or easy it's going to be to get to your community. Um, and it can really just save admin time, right? So we all know that, you know, if you do an Indeed posting, you could, have 70 candidates and, and 40 of them really not be qualified. Um, or, or you might have an opposite problem in that you, you, you do an indeed posting and you only have eight, eight applicants, right? So it can save time. You can delegate this to someone else on your team to say, Hey, here's eight candidates, invite them all Wednesday at three o'clock. Um, and, uh, a, you can see who's on time, who's engaged, who can make it there. Um, you, you just, bought back eight, seven hours of your time by burning up one hour. Um, and let's face it, we, we're in the people business, right? And so it, it can really help um, you get a sense of who's going to fit with your team personality wise, um, and as well as skill set. Uh, again, because resumes don't define us. I'm so happy to share some tricks, tips, questions. Uh, at a later time, you guys can reach out to us uh, anytime. So after you kind of meet a candidate, uh, obviously um, we, we, we require, we deal with a lot of PSWs, nurses, DSWs. So then now it's time for us to verify their documents, right? What we wanted to share with you today, and I'm sure some of you have seen is that uh, we're seeing a lot of documents coming through us that aren't necessarily real. Uh, and so this is something that keep an eye out for. Uh, it's happening more and more. For for instance, um, CLL College, uh, it is a college and it does offer a PSW program. Um, so we know that. But when we when this was sent to us, um, you know, just just a couple of weeks ago, we noticed, you know, when fonts don't tend to match, um, when when the center can be off. Um, time of day. Uh, oftentimes I'll look at the date on, on applications as well, and we'll get into it on the next slide, but um, we're starting to see a lot of um, documents that, that aren't necessarily real and just know that they're out there and there's more and more people that are starting to doctor up documents. So it is important to double check it. Um, uh, we can share this with you after the presentation, but to double check it, you can um, so we verified that that last slide we saw was in fact a certified school that does the uh, that that does teach a PSW curriculum. Um, we're noticing that there's a lot of schools out there um, that are giving certificates um, that aren't necessarily um, they're not a school that's recognized in Ontario. So that link in the middle can you can double check the school, but you can also take it one chip further and double check the caregiver as well if they've graduated from an NACC uh, college. Uh, and then there's nurse lookups as well. Um, so those are some helpful links for you. Uh, and then next would be vulnerable sector search versus the background search. So of course, um, anyone that we work with, we insist that there's a vulnerable sector search that is done. Um, not a regular background check. But again, these are documents that you, you need to scrutinize as well because they're um, we ensure that our team keeps them updated every six months. Um, and But these are documents that uh, know the difference between a vulnerable sector search and background check. I'm sure all of you guys do know, um, but they can be something that can be doctored as well. So um, just make sure that names on uh, sector searches match names on certificates um, and always look at the dates as well. Um, and uh, because those dates can be very telling as well. Uh, so we what a good thing to note is that as you're starting to rack and stack up a file with um, training and training that they've already taken, um, note that don't rely on prior training, right? Um, and so what we do is we 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 have our own internal training, as I'm sure you do as well. Um, but also kind of, I find, especially as a PSW myself, 
um, there's theoretical training, but there's also practical training. So um, in addition to our handbook, oftentimes we'll we'll sit down with our team um, and talk about that said handbook and talk about what is conflict of interest, right? So, um, you know, people, we've all heard it, PSWs, DSWs, they've heard the word conflict of interest. Um, but sometimes it's good to sit down and explain it to them because that short explanation at, at the initial hire can really help you in the long long run. So I, I talk to our care team and say, you can't make money while you're making money, right? <laughs> That's what conflict of interest is. Um, that being said, I mean, I come from Kawartha Lakes. Robert will laugh at this, but everyone in Kawartha Lakes like buys eggs from each other because everyone has chickens and um, it, is it is it harmful for PSW to sell eggs to their client? No, it's not. You know, the client wants fresh eggs. You're going anyway. Um, so yeah, sure, I allowed it. Um, so I owned and operated a, a home care company in Kawartha Lakes for 10 years prior to joining Staff Relief. And it didn't seem like a big deal, right? Um, but when a caregiver is is starting to have those transactions with their client uh, on a weekly basis, um, before you knew it, they entered a, a, an, a relationship that maybe PSW would purchase the old minivan that was in the shed, um, which then turned into maybe I'll just sign the ownership while, while I am at it, right? <laughs> so, so something as simple as, um, hey boss, can I sell some eggs? Uh, can really uh, muddy the waters and turn into something as big as um, I think your PSW has has my uncle's minivan, right? Uh, they, it can happen. Um, and these are the reasons why you want to, um, something as simple as let's say gentle persuasion. Great. It's great that you have gentle persuasion, um, but every brain is unique, right? So we, we like to take it one step further and say, um, okay, let's discuss this particular client now before you go and serve them. Their particular triggers, the, the, the other things that are offered within this facility or organization that will really help you with a responsive behavior um, and not just lean into the fact that, oh, they've got gentle persuasion, that's great, they already know what they're doing, right? Um, these are opportunities that you can take um, to just to talk with your team, uh, and, 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 and sometimes it's just, it's all about just a good fit. Um, like for instance, uh, we joke in the office, I do have the Handelman haircut and, uh, I'll never not have, I'll never not be bald. Uh, and so I remember having a client who was a Holocaust survivor, uh, real hard time dealing with bald men. It, it was a trigger for him. So I knew when I'd go and visit him, I'd always have to throw on a baseball hat, um, and it's just, it's theoretical versus practical, right? If that makes any sense. And it is, it is a um, one on, you know, um, take it one step at a time. Did I miss anything on that one, Robert, that you'd like cover? No, it's great. Um, I think, I, you know, it's uh, our approach that we've found really successful has been, of course, when staff come and they say that they have certain trainings they've done, as you mentioned, gentle persuasion, or, or I've been trained on abuse and neglect, resident bill of rights, or, you know, in, in the developmental support space, we see a lot, you know, safe management, CPI training. We always retrain them to not take for granted things that they've learned. And we do that theoretical training because it's table stakes from, you know, for qualm standards and, um, you know, and the like. But then supplementing that, as Graham said, is, is just about getting to the real reality of what are they going to experience when they walk into that group home or that community center or that family? Who are the individuals there? And how do we prepare them? How do we give them a cheat sheet to do a great job? Because it's nice that you study what you study in school, but that doesn't always translate one for one into reality. So uh, thinking about that, if you're hiring and training your people, um, you know, how do you help them bridge that gap from textbook to, you know, to being on, you know, on the floor? And um, we've found a lot of success in doing that. So perhaps something to think of. Um, yeah. And then practical kind of onboarding is think of the three C's of onboarding, which is you got to tick boxes to be compliance, um, but then always open up that communication to clarify um, like, like as a PSW, um, especially with our one-on-one -on -one clients or our, our private home care clients, one question I always ask is, 
where do we park and what door do we use, right? Like these are little things that, um, you know, it, it, if, if it sets the PSW up for success or failure, almost just if they're knocking at the wrong door, then it, it can really create a, a tense, tense first um, meeting, right? Um, other things to, to keep in mind are your culture um, and, and connections. Um, so for us, like a couple um, practical onboarding things is um, logging in and out of a shift, right, is important for us. We are, we are Ontario wide. Um, we, we use a, uh, technology that does utilize geolocation. Um, so, so if, if we have a PSW that's scheduled for a 10 AM start and they, they're not punched in at 10 AM start, then our coordination team is going to go find them. Not just because, um, it's good customer service to be able to follow up with our client, but, but we've got caregivers that are running the roads, right? We got to make sure that they're okay too. Um, so uh, so it is important that our team members use their app to kind of uh, log in and log out of shifts, but it also helps us make sure that 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 particular caregiver is at where they're supposed to be at that time. Right. Like um, when when you when you're in this business, as long as we've been in it, um, we've seen we've seen caregivers that will um, uh, kind of sub their sub their shift out to someone in their family or another caregiver and say, listen, can you just go work my shift for me? Um, this the kind of stuff will happen, right? So um, having that technology or, or knowing where your team is and the expectation, something as simple as, as name badges we're really adamant on, name badges with a picture to match so you know who's who it is and who they're with, right? Very important. Um, accepting gifts or conflict of interest. We kind of uh, talked about that, about practical onboarding. It's just good to kind of go through it and make sure that the team knows anything in this handbook that, you know, or, or that what you just signed that you'd like to talk about, because give them the opportunity. Um, because especially when you're brand new, you don't want to ask questions. You don't want to, you don't want to rock the boat, create waves, but if they're just plain and simple ask, let's go through this anything you don't understand, then it really helps. Um, and then something that we all know, um, you have a new hire in the door, you kind of have 90 days to figure out that new hire and if they're a good fit with your community, right? Um, with your organization, with whatever uh, whatever it is that you're doing. I, I've always adopted kind of a 30 and a 60 day review. Um, you know, A, by the time you hit 90 days and you have some kind of coaching for a, a team member, it's more or less too late, um, you know, that uh, you're kind of, the, you, you're, you're, you're connected now. Um, so I, I'd like to use the 30 day as, as a time where um, you get to solicit that two-way feedback, right? Um, these, these are, this is a crucial time in the 30 and 60 days and that new, new team members aren't new forever, right? Um, they can often bring great insight into the client, how we're doing things, the location, the, they can bring great insight in that first kind of 30, 60 days, but use that 60 days, um, as a time where you're telling people, listen, you've done all this, right? This is what I really need you to focus on and improve upon and see if it changes, because you really do only have that 90 days to, um, to to tighten that up. And then keep in mind, we all know that you're going to see the absolute best of an individual in the first 90 days. They're probably not going to get any better, right? Um, and um, so so use those, but don't don't kind of put a tickler in your um, uh, on your outlook for 90 days uh, because if there's any area for improvement, it should have been addressed before that. That was a great idea. Thanks for sharing that, Graham. We've, it's something that we've found very successful implementing, certainly for, for ourselves, but also for our partners across the community. Um, as Graham mentioned, you're, you're, you only have a fresh set of eyes once. So as much as we're so focused on giving feedback to improve performance, hey, fix this, fix that. We find so many of the DSWs, the PSWs around the community as they pop into a new location, they bring with them a wealth of experience in other locations. May pop, they may have like, something might come up in their mind to say, hey, why are we, why are you guys doing it like this? Or have you ever thought of this or that? And we invite them to do that. And as a result, have come up with some excellent ideas and improved um, 
you know, partners' processes and ways they've done things over the years. Um, but that that story that Graham brought up earlier about the logging in and out of shifts many, many years ago before, you know, technology was what it was today. We did have, uh, you know, there was a story of someone who showed up for work and, um, you know, and, and had subletted that shift to another person. And the performance of that other person was subpar because they were not vetted by our organization, by staff relief. And I, re I do recall us taking a call from the client saying, I can't believe, you know, this person, they're not doing a good job. They're new. He said they were excellent and found out later that the person we thought we were sending wasn't there. And when you've got people out in the community, out and about, and, you know, you know, if they're at one community center, one group home, it's one thing, but as they're new, people are meeting them, making sure you have extra controls in place to avoid things like this and others are, are part of um, what we believe is a core onboarding process. Um, you know, I'd say, you know, at the end of the hiring cycle, you know, you can excel in all the things we've talked about in, in attracting and bringing in great talent and hiring them, training them, onboarding them, but you find yourself on this continual turnstile um, if you've got people leaving as quickly as you're hiring them. And we we found, we work with many partners across the community that have this problem. You know, there's a hole in the bottom of the barrel and you keep pouring water in, but the barrel isn't filling up. Um, so getting to the core of retention is something that's really important to us at Staff Relief so that our core pool of individuals stay. And, and I hope that you can do the same in your communities as well. Um, it really, you know, the core of it is really thinking about what, what do people want most um, and how do they rank and value those things? And you and I are not so dissimilar from many of the, you know, the direct care workers that are supporting the members, the individuals, the people in your communities that we're, we're here to serve. Um, you know, at, at the core of you know, and this this chart is not necessarily in order, but you know, wages are definitely at the top of the list for people. Um, especially, there's been much research about how people view at certain income brackets the value of each additional dollar to their to their happiness and well-being. Um, certainly, um, it 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 it's got a disproportionate effect at lower income brackets and. We recognize that. And for many of the PSWs and DSWs working an additional 50 cents or dollar per hour to their wage is a big number for them. Um, we, you know, sometimes the partners we work with are unionized environments and you're handicapped that way in terms of what you can and cannot offer them. And it is streamlined and regimented, but to the extent there's flexibility, I think it's important to recognize that's certainly a number one motivator um, for staff. We've seen flexibility of schedules um, has been another piece that people really care about, having the opportunity to not work every weekend or um, work the times that are, are, you know, coordinate with their family. Again, sometimes we've seen in unionized environments, there's some challenges implementing that, but we found a great retention piece has allowed us to listen to what the staff want and try and craft the schedule around them. Um, again, that's a non-financial factor. Um, the recognition and reward piece is also really important. I think, you know, it sort of plays into the, the meritocracy item on the slide, fostering a culture of meritocracy where you can really reward people for their efforts, for their contributions, and not just because they've been around for 40 years, but because they've actually made a difference every day for those 40 years. Um, we found that that has a really outsized impact in making people happy. Um, and we find creative ways to do that, both with a phone call and a check-in to see, to say, hey, I noticed you, you did a great job. I appreciate you. So it doesn't always have to be dollars, but sometimes, you know, um, buying someone dinner for Easter weekend to say, I know you worked really hard and I want to thank you. So we're going to give you a little extra something. Please treat your family to a dairy queen on us, something like that. Those little gestures 
um, go a really long way, more than, you know, I, I, I wouldn't say the same as, as a salary increase, but sometimes when you're limited with some of the financial um, measures you have, these are other things you can use that make people feel valued. You know, um, managing burnout is a piece that we found very often. We, we've got a formula, we track people's hours on a weekly, bi-weekly basis. And we sometimes see people that are working, you know, 100 hours a week and they say they want to do that. We want the extra money, we want to do that. More often than not, over our 25 year history, we found that after a couple months, those people get sick, those people look for another job, they just, they run themselves to the ground. And um, sometimes you find yourself in that situation where you don't have enough staff and you're you're stuck and everyone has to pick up extra. But you know, another retention piece is recognizing that we're all human. And um, as much as we're willing to give and give and give and give, there is a point where you break and then you say, I can't do this anymore. And you never know when that's going to happen. So trying to manage that from the outset is really important. Um, we find also, you know, a piece, a tip that's worked really well with us are regular check-in points and these performance reviews. You know, not saving a performance review for an annual season, the end of a year to say, here's what we liked and here's what we didn't like and here are the metrics you're going to fill out. Like, we find that that rigidity doesn't always foster the best. Um, checking in, you know, to the orientation piece, 30, 60, 90 days at um, at the outset, but then after in intervals, maybe of two months or three months, regular check-ins with staff to sit down and have two-way feedback. We find work really well. And that helps us also resolve problems that are festering in a staff member before you get that resignation letter on your desk, before they've accepted another position. Now, I can't tell you how many times in, in our history where I wish I would have known a staff only had told me they were upset about this or that. I could have fixed it for them. And I didn't know until the date that they handed in their resignation and we had an exit interview, but it was too late. So learning from that experience, we make a real effort to check in with everybody on the frequent and, and make sure we can call out these things and fix them. Um, you know, and, and then sort of that final piece I, I found over over many years of, of working for others and also running our practice, we, the, the pay raises or increases sometimes are kept secret from staff. And, and that might be a, a process, a function of, of unionization and, and maybe restrictions there. But to the extent possible, we find transparency in the pay scale and how people can, um, you know, approach that part of, of their job is really helpful. You know, staff can know that, hey, here are my metrics and here's what I'm going to be assessed by. And if I do X, Y, and Z, I could be due for, you know, a 50 cent increase at the end of a year. That could be motivating. Um, and, and we find, it, it, you know, quite significantly is rather than waiting to the end of a year for a surprise and, and then often finding that surprise perhaps underwhelming and people being upset and leaving afterwards. So we, we fix that model a little bit and it's worked well for us. Um, there's a couple different um, tools you can use as well. There are some organizations that uh, we've heard of where, you know, you sort of part of a, an increase or a bonus system could be put away in a pot for later, um, which you, you vest over a number of years. And that's, that's sort of a little cookie for later. So that's a financial retention piece. There are a couple creative ideas in this category that certainly kind of happy to share if you're an ability or you have the ability to, uh, to collaborate on those. You know, at Staff Relief, we, we take all these things really seriously, um, certainly as we support the communities, um, you know, in the organizations and certainly some of the COO members. Um, it's important that we have continuity of care in our staff and we preach the, you know, the, we, you know we employ the same things that we're preaching today. Um, one thing that's been, uh, I'd say, um, I, I, a grant, you know, a groundbreaking change in, in our world. Um, you know, I, I don't like that word agency, um, but often used in the space is we treat our staff the same way as they would be treated anywhere else. Um, and uh, health and dental benefits 
for full-time workers, especially the frontline staff, are not table stakes. Most agencies don't have the ability to do this and don't. Um, we feel so passionate about paying as much forward to our you know, staff or really family in the community, knowing that no matter how interesting or, or smart Graham and I may be, how many stories we have to tell, we are only as good as the DSWs and PSWs, and nurses, social workers we have out in the community. And the better we treat them, the better they will treat the, you know, the, the families and the members and individuals they're entrusted to care. So health and dental benefits and a really great program there, you know, pension plans associated with that, not paying workers simply cash and having them think about their job as a side gig has allowed, um, has greatly improved our retention and allowed people to take greater ownership of what they do. Um, so that really all kind of dovetails into everything we've discussed today. Um, but certainly we recognize through and through um, you know, the HR problem, many of the, uh, the partners that we work with in the community is ongoing. It's really hard to hire people, to retain people. They're the backbone of what you need to do in the community. And we recognize that challenge. Um, hopefully today, there's been a couple nuggets of things that, um, that you can take away. Hopefully some things that you've, uh, you've already been doing and incorporated into your HR practice. And and maybe some new ideas, but certainly welcome um, your your questions. If you'd like to, uh, you know, chat about anything now and and discuss anything in greater detail, we are absolutely happy to. Um, certainly after today's Zoom, if you feel like you'd love a discussion and you know one on one, more personalized, we are always have time um, to uh, to meet more members in the community and. Um, I thank you. We're humbled to have had the opportunity to speak to all of you. So thank you for your time and um, thank you for your attention and for listening. Amazing, Robert. Thank you so much. Thank you, Graham. Um, yeah, as uh, Robert said, um, if anybody has any questions um, at this point, feel free to either put them in the chat if you're comfortable doing that, or if you are more comfortable just unmuting and putting a video on, feel free to do that. Um, I know that both Robert and Graham are happy to answer any questions that you may have. And as Robert said, if uh, now is not the time, um, we will definitely be sharing some contact information so you can um, inquire as uh, at your leisure. So um, yeah, but thank you so much, guys. Uh, that was incredibly informative. Um, it was nice to see all of our attendees uh, stayed the entire time. So that's a re really, really positive sign. Is oh, we have a question. Perfect. Um, what platforms are most people using for job postings? That's great. Um, thank you for uh, for that question, Sharon. Um, we found um, that indeed is really got the market share for uh, for for the candidates, certainly in a direct support space. So we, we found there's two platforms that have worked really well for us. It's indeed, when you're looking for PSWs, DSWs, social workers, um, things of that sort. If you have a more technical role you're using or looking for, we actually use LinkedIn a little bit for that. Um, LinkedIn is more of a, what's called a passive platform. So that's when we're reaching out to candidates that aren't actively looking for a job. They're working elsewhere and we're sort of looking to maybe poach them or entice them to consider a new opportunity. Um, so that's where we kind of would use that platform. And indeed, if we have a job posting in the new location or city, um, that, that's, uh, that's the platform we use there. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Yes. And uh, our next question um, is coming from Jennifer and it is, what app are you using for signing in and out of your shift? Yeah, there's, there's a couple, it's, it's a great idea. It's a great question, Jennifer. There's a couple different apps that do the same thing. We use one that's an all-in-one system. It's called Generations Healthcare. I'm certainly happy to introduce you to that team if you'd like, which has, um, has both a um, a scheduling piece where it has that geolocation sign in and out, but then it also has a clinical piece. So for families that are reaching out to us, 
um, our caregivers can actually document care plans um, and care notes into the app and sort of uh, follow certain tasks during the day so we can guide them. So it, it's kind of an all-in-one care system that way. Um, it also has a little bit of an HRIS component where we can have some you know, candidate documents and things internally. So it's called Generations Healthcare. But there's some other great, we, we've over the years demoed and, and met um, you know, many or interviewed many different providers. So if it's something you're thinking about for, uh, you know, for your team, I'm happy to, uh, to give you a short list of some kind of different programs to investigate. Awesome, thank you, Robert. Um, we have one other question. Um, just wondering how much you use your gut instinct when you hire. Yeah, it, it's a good question. Um, thanks, Lisa, for that. We talked about this a little earlier in the presentation in terms of, you know, unconscious bias and, um, you know, how to potentially avoid that. Um, it's really challenging to, to not, um, you know, to not let your personal bias get into weighing a candidate. And we've done a great job at um, taking that bias out of the candidate screening process initially using, you know, applicant tracking systems and, and some AI technologies. But ultimately, you eventually meet the person and you develop a first impression of them. And your first impression is very often a function of your past experiences. You know, someone will remind you of either a great hire you've made in the past or maybe somebody who hasn't, um, you know, has burned you and, and it, you know, turned out to be a mistake. Uh, we combat that in a couple ways. So certainly having more than one person have eyeballs on um, a candidate helps because your personal bias is not going to be the same as everybody else's. And independently of one another, we try and score that candidate without first talking to one another. So I'll say, I think this person was an eight out of 10 and Graham may say a nine out of 10 and Russell may say a 10 out of 10. And we'll compare it, we'll first do that assessment separately and then come to the table. And if we're all aligned, um, there's a good chance our, you know, our, our gut instinct was right. But it's also, you know, if, if, if one person is on, one person is off, um, having multiple in the room to balance is really helpful and doesn't you know, sort of keep all your eggs in one basket, the hiring manager per se. So kind of having multiple people, multiple levels, help us balance, um, you know, the bias from a gut instinct. Awesome. Thank you very much, Robert. <clears throat> well, uh, yeah, we're, yeah, you guys, amazing. Uh, just about time. And I don't see um, any more questions in the chat. Um, if anybody has a question, is more comfortable just unmuting or putting their video on, feel free. Um, but save for that, um, I would say thank you so much, uh, Robert and Graham. That was an incredibly insightful and informative presentation on what seems to be an ever-present topic for our members and our sector in general. Um, I hope that everyone gained some new approaches. Oh. Is there any, are there any questions? No, nope, we're good. Okay, sorry, just wanted to make sure. Um, yeah, I hope that we all learn some new approaches to staffing solutions as Robert and Graham presented so confidently for us today. Um, Community Living Ontario would like to thank Robert Handelman, again, CEO, and Graham Bashford, Director of Development from our strategic partners, Staff Relief Healthcare Solutions Incorporated for presenting this webinar today. Um, as I mentioned in our intro, a follow-up email with a recording of the webinar will be shared shortly afterwards with everyone who attended and registered. Um, and if you have any remaining questions or would like to get in touch with Staff Relief, information for your contact, who is Robert, will also be in our follow-up email. Um, thank you again for attending today. Um, we look forward to seeing you at another CLO webinar, and I hope you all have a lovely day and a great week. Thanks, Thank guys. You. Thank you so much for your time. Pleasure meeting everybody. And uh, I hope our uh, paths cross again soon. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank, thanks thanks so much. Thanks, everyone.